Okay, we're in section 31 of the notes. Um, I know it's gonna be a tough section for a lot of students. One is the background in, uh, uh, even if they took a course at Essex County College, the background in Math 120. And it's, it's really kind of um, something that's really foundational. And certainly when I teach Math 120, not only do I introduce the summation formulas, but I prove them using PMI. And then in the appendices of my notes, I actually derive the sum formulas, right? I actually derive them. Now in Math 120, you have to realize that not every instructor does the same thing, although our syllabus says that this should be done, all right? So you may have to go back and shore up a deficiency in Math 120. You can do that, certainly if you have a textbook on pre-calculus, um, which you, I don't know if you do have or not, or you can go to my website. And again, if you wanna come by during office hours, I can outline where this stuff is, including the principle of mathematical induction or PMI and my appendices, which actually prove these sum formulas. But anyway, uh, we'll go through this with the whiteboard. I'll talk about it one step at a time. I'm not gonna reteach 120 though, not in 121, but you're more than welcome to rewatch the lectures if you want, or if they're helpful from Math 120 to learn that material if you need to. All right, we'll talk about doing some problems. I'll go through that with you. Of course, I'm gonna point out, I'm not a big um, fan of memorization. However, a lot of students are, and everything's a memorization skill. All right, but we'll go through these problems over here. And then we'll talk about something that's related to calculus. Again, this is all the 120 review material over here. And then we're gonna to go to some calculus material. For the most part, areas though, are gonna be quite simple to do. And the reason for that is, you know a great deal about area already. Like, you know, areas of squares, rectangles, you know, the area of a, uh, of a circle, uh, you know, the area of a triangle, yada, yada, yada. You know a lot of area formulas. And if you see a, if you see a shape and you know the formula for the area of that shape, that's all you're gonna do. But then of course we get to these, these problems that the area doesn't look like what we expect it to be like a rectangle or a triangle. So what we do is we try to divide it into pieces and we'll go through that. Right now though, this is gonna look like it's from a different planet. Over time though, this stuff will become more understood, right? I will read this to you though, not verbatim, but I'll read this to you. So there's some initial impression of it. But what we're gonna be doing though, is we're gonna go through examples and then we're gonna see a visualization of what their example's talking about. And then we're gonna talk about the notation. The notation initially is gonna to be tough to look at. I wanna point out this symbol over here. It reminds me of the letter S. So really what are we doing? We're summing together little tiny pieces over here. Now, of course, I'm seeing this thing for what they are. You might say, oh, it's a trapezoid. I don't mind you saying that it is. You could say it's a rectangle and a triangle. I don't mind if you want to say that what it is, or you could see other objects there. All right, what are we doing? We're trying to figure out the area of that. And we'll go through that. And we'll do that for every problem that follows. All right, every problem that follows, we'll do that. Now, where's that coming from? That's in the example section. Now, before we get to the examples though, I'm going to walk you through the notes. All right, so let's go to that. I'm going to do another share with you. And give me a second. I got to get that share working again. I clicked on the wrong thing. All right. We're at the section we need to be at. So my claim over here, looking at this thing over here is that, again, I'll read it to you. It certainly says introduction to areas. It is just an introduction. We'll certainly spend more time in this. And what do you got over here? I mean, looking at it, it's introduction to areas. All right here, we're going to say, you know, we need to spend some time just simply, you know, telling you that there is a responsibility that you have. When you get to this class, the responsibility is you've taken Math 120. And by that, I mean responsibly taken it. That is study what the teacher told you to study and learn the material. And in Math 120, you were given summation formulas to do, right? So I'm going to claim over here. I, I see these things over here. And let me just do one at a time for you. Certainly you, were done, you did something like this. These are finite sums, by the way. You know, what does it mean? A1 plus A2 plus A3 up to AN. So what's I? It's a counter variable. Starts at one, goes to two, goes to three, or up to N. This one over here, not much different. What do you got a constant multiple? Well, it's gonna be KA1, KA2, KA3 up to KAN. 
What do I notice? I could factor a K out from that, and then I get the original sum back, all right? This one over here, likewise, it kind of follows, and these things, again, were presented and shown to you in Math 120. Then you had some problems over here. 10, 11, and 12 are very reasonable statements for most students. Take a little bit of thought, what's reasonable. These are where students get confused. We're not trying to confuse you. 13, 14, 15, and 16. Let's talk about this one over here. What does it say? Start at one, go to two, go to three, go to four, go to five, go to six, go to seven, all in. And what would you get? Every term is the same. Every term is K. How many terms would you have though? If you started at one and you stopped at N, there would be N of them. So was it equal to NK? What do we do? We removed all this nonsense and wrote a, a simple statement down. Now this one over here, this is the sum of the integers from one to N. In Math 120, you prove this using PMI. If you took the course with me, I also derived the formula using an historical treatment, the Gaussian method, so to speak. And then we talked about a more formal approach, sort of had to do with the binomial expansion. But we proved this. Not only do we prove it with PMI, we also derived it. In Math 120, you prove this was equivalent to this. How'd you do that? P, I go back to blacking, I'm sorry. You prove this by PMI. And if you had Math 120 with me, I also derived the formula. I actually derived it. I'm not going to say it's easy to derive, but I derived it. In, and by the way, in Math 120, you also did this. Whoops, I did it again. I, I'm, today I'm really screwing up. Let's take a look at this thing. In Math 120, you derived, I'm not derived, sorry, you shouldn't say derived. You proved it. How'd you prove it? You proved it by PMI. What's PMI? The principle of mathematical induction. However, if you took me for Math 120, I also derived, and by the way, it was derived in my, um, my appendices. That material is up there, including videos of me going through that, if you're interested. Now, someone says, I'm really not interested. I'm going to memorize. I'm not opposed to it, all right? So what do I mean by not opposed to it? A lot of teachers just demand this. They don't do PMI. They don't derive. They just say, memorize, memorize, memorize. I don't like that. I'd rather have you think through it. So I'm going to say, if you need those formulas, you could derive those formulas, and then you could prove the formula using PMI. But right now, I'm going to say, you know what? If you need to, I guess we could look these guys up. All right, so let's look at the next, next page. And as I go through this over here, I want to point out, I'm looking at it, and they want me to compute this. So before I do anything, I want to tell you what some students do, which I don't find unusual. I just find it kind of painful. So they start plugging in. They say zero. And then we put it in zero minus one plus one. And then it would be one minus one plus two. And then two minus one plus Oh, it's painful. They keep writing stuff down. I got to be honest with you, though. I'm going to say, I think I know the pattern. Question is, where does it stop? 50, 50 minus one. So what they could do is this. They could say zero times minus one plus one times zero plus two times one. I think I could write this down forever. Three times two plus yada, 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 plus 50 times 49. I got troubles with this stuff. I'll tell you what the troubles are. Some people say, how many terms are there? And I, I've actually seen this. They say there's one, two, three, four, five. There's not five terms there. You're missing this, the meaning of that. What's the meaning of that? There's a certain number of terms over here. How many terms are there? 
there's 51 terms. I do not want to do 51 terms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to write sums down for this. And as I do this over here, I'm going to write this down over here. J equals zero to 50. I'm going to expand this over here. And that's going to be J squared minus J. Don't be intimidated. I'm going to split it. And I'm using what I got from that prior page into two summations. And that's going to be J equals zero to 50 J squared minus J equals zero to 50 J. Then what am I going to do? I realize that they're starting at zero, but if I start at zero, zero squared is zero. So this is identical to J equals one to 50 J squared minus J equals one to 50 of J. Now I start to realize that I know the formulas for these. So it says, I don't remember the formula. Well, I gotta be honest with you, if you don't remember the formula, go back and look at them over here. So I'm gonna say, this is one of them. This is some of the integers from one to n. What's it gonna be? n, n plus one. I'll write this down for you. n, n plus one over two. Let's go back over that. I'll show you where that is, right over here. n was 50, 50 plus one over two. Then I'm gonna do this one over here, all right? What's it gonna be? n, n plus one, two n plus one. Let me do that. n, n plus one. Let me write 50, I'm not, and then what's gonna be? Twice n, that's 50, twice n's 50, 100, plus one. Over what number? Again, if you can't remember, look back over six. Hope I didn't go too fast. I realize what someone's going to say. Do I need to do that computation? I would like you to try. And I'm going to go through that with you now. So I'm looking at it. And I, I have to make the arithmetic easier for me. And the second term, I'm going to say it's 25. Whoops, I made a mistake there. 25. Why is that? Two goes into 50, 25 times, times 51. I'll do that later. Now I'm looking at this, I'm gonna say two goes into six, three times, and it goes into 50, 25 times. Three goes into 51, 17 times. I know this is painful for a large number of students. I still wanna go through it. Arithmetic is an important skill. However, I have never been terribly good at it. All right, so what I wanna do is I wanna do the arithmetic for you. And someone says, can I use the calculator? I don't mind, I really don't. Other teachers at Essex do though, and other people in the world do. I just have no worries about it. But let me write this one down for you. 51 times 25. Five times one is five. Five times five is 25. Two times one is two. Two times five is 10. Five, seven, two, one. So that's gonna be minus one, two, seven, five. Let me do the other one, more difficult, but I got to do it for you. The first thing I want to do is I want to do 17 times 101. Let's do that. Seven, zero, seven. One, zero, one. Seven, one, seven, one. Then I have to multiply by 25. Yes, I know it's painful. Five times seven is 35. Five, eight, 35, five, eight, two times seven is 14, two, three, 14, two, three, five, 12, nine, whoops, got all excited, 12, four, two, nine, two, five. All right, let's go back up here. I want to point out these numbers are written here for a reason for you. We'd like you to be able to do that. Now, granted, someone says, do I have to do it? If you really can't do it or it's taking you forever, please 
use a calculator. Done. Let's do this one over here. Looks kind of crazy, doesn't it? I mean, really crazy looking. Right, so I have no idea how to do that. You do though, and I'll tell you why. What you're looking at basically is you're looking at a limit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this, the last thing I'm gonna do. I wanna do this first. I wanna see if I can do it. I wanna see, can I do J equals one to some finite number N where the sum is J cubed over N four. So what I'm gonna do over here is realize that N is a fixed number. So I'm pulling it out. I know this seems difficult. J equals one to N. And then what do you have here? J cubed. And so I don't remember. Or in 120, our teacher was really nice. He didn't make us do anything. Here's the deal. It's that over there. So I'm gonna write that down. So let's write this down. So it's gonna be one over N four, and then we get N, N plus one over two quantity squared. So let me tell you what I've done. I've removed the summation symbol and that's a miracle. So I'm gonna tell you what I get if I do that. I get four N four on bottom. On top, I get N squared n plus one squared. I'm gonna to continue to simplify. And if I do that, what do I get? Four n squared on bottom. One of the n squares cancels off. On top, I get n squared plus two n plus one. I'm gonna to continue to simplify. What would I get? n squared over four n squared plus two n over four n squared plus one over four n squared. Someone says, why would you do that? We'll go through the second, because I need to take a limit. Which give me one quarter plus two, I'm sorry, not two, I'm sorry. One over two n plus one over four n squared. Let me tell you what I did. We just did this. This turns out to be this. Now what do I have to do? I must do the limit. So I didn't do the limit part. Let's do that now. Limit as big N goes towards infinity of this thing. What does that give me? One quarter. Bingo, got it. Let's go to the next page. Area. finally getting there. We'll be looking at computing areas of bounded regions. By the way, there's area of unbounded regions. We're not there yet though. We're just looking at bounded regions. Some are gonna be incredibly familiar. Let me give you an example what familiar would be. If someone gave me this object over here, I would say, oh, that's a rectangle. What do I need to know? The length and the width. What's the area? I would say length times width. What's another one I know? I may know a triangle. If I see this one over here, I'm gonna say this is the base and this is the height, that's base. What's the area of that guy? Area is one half base times height. What's another really familiar area now? A circle, a radius R. What's the area of a circle? It's gonna be pi R squared. I know familiar areas, rectangles, triangles and circles. By the way, there's many other ones, but right now they're the three basic ones. Some, however, are going to be horribly unfamiliar to you. What do you mean horribly unfamiliar to you? You will not know the formula for their areas. Are there formulas for the areas? Yes, we just don't know them yet. We will figure that out. So I'm gonna say over here, basic skills in computing area of irregular or regularly shaped regions are gonna be something you have to deal with, all right? There's gonna be a variety of units. For the most part, we don't bother with units initially, but we'll talk about that as we start going through the problem set. Maybe there will be units, all right? So it goes on and says over here, let's say we're given a rectangle with a base of this and a height of this. Let me write down what I mean by that. That seems strange to me. So I think a rectangle could even look like that. 
let me just write this down, a rectangle. They said the base has a unit on it, six centimeters an hour. And then they said the height of it, right? This is a rectangle, right? Height is what? 15 minutes. Here's what they say. What's the area going to be? Well, I know the area. It's at length times width business. Let me write this down. So it's going to be six area of this object over here. Let's write this down. Six centimeters per hour times 15 minutes. My God, that looks terrible, doesn't it? I got to figure that out though. And what I'm looking at is six centimeters. What's hours in terms of minutes though? It's 60 minutes, right? Times 15 minutes. What do I notice now? Minutes cancel off. Six goes into 60, 10 times. 15 and 10 have five in common. So what am I left off with? Three halves of a centimeter. That might seem weird to you though, but really what is this thing? This is rate and this is time. And area in this case actually is distance. That may seem strange to you, but I need to know the units. And what's the answer? Three halves of a centimeter. All right. By the way, there's a little footnote over there. And the footnote, I think they write it down for you right over there. All right. Anyway, let's keep reading. It says, you know, your ability to visualize rectangles is essential. And I'll be honest with you. Almost all our areas will boil down to rectangle problems. However, you should be recognized that there's also going to be circles and, and squares and triangles, really simple grade school areas for you. All right, here's where the tough part comes. And this is the part where we're taking these concepts of sums, right? The sums we did, infinite sums, which we just did in the prior section, and these little tiny rectangles that we're going to have together. We'll get there, but right now, I just want to read it to you. This is the definite integral. Let's read it over. We'll go through examples later, but suppose F is continuous on an interval between A and B. The definite integral of F from A to B is written this way over here. What's the meaning of that? And my claim over here is that that thing that looks like an elongated S is actually a summation. And what kind of summation is going to be? Little tiny rectangles. And this is where our troubles are going to lie and be able to visualize this. We generally have no trouble visualizing this. And this section of the notes will be making some attempt to visualize that. The next part of this notes, when we go to the examples, we'll be visualizing a sum, which is called a left-hand sum. Don't worry about the direction yet. The other one is visualizing these things here as a right-hand sum. We'll go through that. I actually favor right-hand sums. I'll tell you why. They start at one. The other one started at zero. Each of these sums is called the Riemann sum. F is called the integrand. A and B are called the limits of integration. The strange looking symbols we got over here will be discussed when we do the examples as it relates to what's called a signed area. We will discuss that when we're going to example. For now, I just want to suggest that you concentrate on computing areas and noting how best to approximate areas using rectangles. I actually prefer rectangles, but you can use triangles, you can use circles, you can use squares, you can use all kinds of objects to approximate area. For example, if you're sitting in a room, you could look at the floor. If it's tiled, you could approximate the area of the room by counting the tiles up if you want. Tiles are generally uh, one by one or, or one foot square. You're expected to be, be able to compute both finite and infinite sums. This takes time to understand, by the way, and you're not going to get it right away. It will take times. So I'm going to say over here, what's really the big bridge over here is you're trying to extend the finite to the infinite. And that's what we're really trying to do in calculus. We're trying to extend finite concepts to infinite and we'll get there one step at a time. All right, examples will come up next. 
I know this was a tough section. Again, if you need to review with 120 material, we would recommend you do so. Thank you.